So, hi everyone, could you please start making, hang on, please start making your seat, get, get to your seats and we'll get started very soon. As soon as everyone makes their seats, we'll get started. Okay, everyone, if you could please take your seats, we'll get started as soon as everyone's seated. If not, we'll just get going and you can stand over there if you wish. So the clicker doesn't work, so I'm gonna to have to move, unfortunately, back to, the, um, back to the laptop. But thank you everyone for joining today. This is the OWASP Bay Area chapter. And this is my first time emceeing this particular chapter. I also help run Angular San Francisco, so I have been to this wonderful place in Okta before. Huh. Okay, let's try that again. View, present. Okay, let's go back. Okay, it works, wonderful. Um, so yeah, if you could please just take your seats, we'll get started. This is quite um, an important piece of um, OWASP Bay Area chapter. So the first thing that we need, everyone needs to understand is that you know, we're, we're all about diversity and inclusion. They're a core aspect of our chapter and we wish that hopefully everyone is also on the same page. To be blunt, obviously the, we don't want people to be jerks. We want to make sure everyone's being treated with respect. So please do that, treat someone how you would wish to be treated yourself. And if you, of course, are a jerk, um, you will be asked to leave and you won't be welcome at any more events. So please do not be a jerk. Um, finally, if you do feel like someone is treating you in a way you do not wish to be treated, come and speak to myself. There's also Tad, or if you could stick your hand up, so also Tad as well. So please make sure you say hi to Tad as well, if you're, of course, uh, in this particular distress. So... When we think about the OWASP Bay Area, today obviously we're having it at Okta, so thank you Okta, but our next meetups for the San Francisco meetup is gonna be in January, and uh, the South Bay meetup will also be in January. So please, they haven't been determined yet, but we will of course start posting on social media once we determine those and lock them down. So if you're also interested in speaking, come and speak to us, we're looking for speakers. And hosting, if anyone here works at a wonderful space like this, please let us know. So, other events that you need to understand about OWASP as well is obviously OWASP is going to be running apps at California in Santa Monica. So I believe the call for papers are now closed. I didn't get accepted, so I won't be speaking there, unfortunately, but it's at January 21st and 24th. It's on the beach. It's wonderful. I would highly recommend getting your companies to sponsor you or to pay for you to go, or just let them take you have some PTO and go and enjoy some time at the beach. Sorry, did you want to take a screenshot? You got it? Okay, cool. So obviously there's many ways for it to connect with us. The first way of course is to follow our meetup. That's where we post all of our events. So please make sure you check the meetup. We also have Twitter and Instagram. So please follow us as OWASP Bay Area. And finally, all of the Hacker Thursday meetups will happen on YouTube. So make sure anything that's been recorded, they will show up on OWASP Hacker Thursday. And of course we also have a LinkedIn group. So please follow our LinkedIn. So this is the schedule for today. So 5.30, everyone obviously is already here. This is the introduction. So hi, I'm Lewis. That's Tad over there. And of course, you know, don't be a jerk. And then, so now I'm going to write out my spiel for Justin. So we're going to have Justin speak. And if you've ever wanted to know how to find vulnerabilities in Ruby on Rails, then Justin is the person to speak for you as he created Breakman Security. Nobody knows why his Twitter handle is President Beef, and I don't think he has any connection with IBM or Hexdumps. Mm. One person. Yes, dead beef. Let's go. Okay. And then without further ado, our first speaker is Justin on the end of the AppSec team. So, oh, he's, he's not ready. So, <laughs> so, is there anything else you'd like to comment on right now, Tad, while we wait for Justin? Yes, I, we already mentioned Upset California, Santa Monica, 2020.
uh, and wasn't on Zoom. So. Hello. Okay, yes. I was working on that. Working on it. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I feel like I just like stepped off Bart and then got on stage. So this is exciting. I feel like I should say something. Um, can you tell us what President Beef means? No. <laughs> Goes all the way back to high school, so. Yeah. So it wasn't about IBM? Nope, no, nope, not about IBM. So anyways, I'll be giving this talk. It's called the end of the AppSec team. And uh, I wanna preface it with some things. So this is fine that we're waiting. Um, one is that this is more of like a, a conceptual talk, a thought provoking talk, uh, not a solutions talk. So just to set you up to begin with, it doesn't have solutions at the end despite the title. Uh, another thing you should know is that I originally wanted to call this uh, Kill Your AppSec Team. And I got some feedback from people that that was like a little bit harsh. And it was actually, it came across much harsher than I meant. I meant more like in a metaphorical sense, like kill your heroes, you know, that kind of thing, not kill your AppSec Team or anyone related to the AppSec Team. Okay. Um, my name is Justin Collins, President Beef on the Internet. Uh, I've worked some places. <laughs> You'd see it on the screen. Wow, this is definitely the most awkward I've ever started off a talk. Um, anyways, I've I've been uh, on security teams. Um, at a few different places at at and Interactive, which became YP, uh, at Twitter, which is still Twitter, um, at uh, SurveyMonkey, and I'm actually now at Gusto, but I've just started there, so it doesn't really count as experience. In the meantime, I did write a tool, a static analysis security tool for Ruby on Rails called Breakman. Then I started a company for Breakman Pro. Then I sold Breakman Pro to Synopsys. So kind of put the, pieces together, the experience is being on security teams, being on AppSec teams, and then also like static analysis security tools. So to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, how are we doing? Good. All right. We are so close. So close. Oh, another thing you need to know as we're like running a little bit late. Uh, this, when I gave this talk previously, it was 50 minutes. So uh, hoping to get this done in 30 minutes. Can I do it? Probably. I can do it. Thank you. I needed that. All right. Can we do this? Getting so close. No signal. Hey. All right. This full screen. We can't get the. All right. That's fine. Okay. Let me test. Yes. All right. 
We're on our way to the end of the AppSec team. Except for that. Except for that. We got it. We got it. Don't worry. Don't worry. We can do it. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. Otherwise, that would have been me sweating up there. All right. Uh, very important note, talking of emphasis on team, the AppSec team. I want to get rid of the AppSec team, not the end of AppSec. I don't think that that's possible. Uh, or even AppSec engineers. I think that's a valuable role that we should continue to have so I can remain employed. All right. And many of you as well. Go forward. Oh, no. It worked once. Did we lose? Did I lose something? <laughs> Oh, because you clicked the thing, right? Because you clicked on the Zoom window. Now we gotta get back to the back to the browser window. No, you're in the share. Oh, I'm in the share. Yeah. Should be okay. I think just gotta click on the browser window. No. Click on the browser window. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We got it. We got it. So while everyone is uh, sitting on the sides, if everyone could just move in a little bit so people can sit from who are standing as well, if that's possible. Um, lots of empty seats in the middle. So if anyone can just squeeze into the middle so we can get more people on the end, and that'll be perfect. Thank you. Yes. Make friends. OK. I want you to know I did update these slides, but then we had the whole thing with the laptop. So anyways. There you go. There's some logos. All right. Um, okay, so get into, a, get into our, our thinking here. Uh, I just want you to think about this. It's 2019, almost in, but let's 2019 for purposes of this joke. Uh, 10 years in the future, that's 2029. What is AppSec going to look like? What are AppSec teams going to look like? Well, I have some good news. Uh, we don't have to worry about it because in 2029, the robots have taken over and we will be far too busy shooting at them or whatever that, to uh, worry about AppSec. We will probably be much more on defensive security and AppSec, uh, we won't have an internet or anything, so we'll be fine, right? Uh, in fact, uh, the first Terminator movie calls 2029 the year of darkness. <laughs> Was that even in the movie? I don't know. Anyways, I already gave a talk that was Terminator themed, so I'm not going to do that again. Don't worry. Uh, I was also going to try to make a Ghost in the Shell joke because that's also 2029, but there's nothing work safe uh, images for that. All right, here's the question I want you to think about first. Are AppSec teams just completely destined to fail? I, I've thought about this and I kind of feel like, yeah, maybe probably. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's, t let's think about what are some of the roles, I'm sorry, this is kind of small for this room, uh, some of the roles that AppSec teams have. I tried really to stick to things that are really like AppSec team jobs. I have like, you know, review project designs, review code changes, do threat modeling, train your developers, run tools, triage the results of those tools, automate those tools, um, poke at your applications, uh, deal with penetration test results, bug bounty results, try to automate some security tests, maybe set up security alerts, um, deal with security incidents, maybe spend some time trying to write some libraries, create some security champions, and I think you could probably add more things to this list. Additionally, I feel like every AppSec team I've been on, we dealt with way more than just AppSec, right? Like other things happen, you have to deal with it. So, this is like a lot of things for one team to deal with, right? I, I think so. Uh, I, I ran across this several years ago. This is real. Um, size of security team, the options were just me, less than five or more than five. Those were the only options. And I, I saw that and I'm like, wow, that is perfect. Okay, here's a very generous scenario where we have 96 developers uh, because I, the image had four people on it. Anyways, um, and four AppSec people, which is actually a very generous ratio. That's like one to 24 or something. Um, whereas, of course, if you've seen many talks about this kind of thing, it's like one to 100 developers, right? So this is actually generous. And yet, look at how many more developers there are. They are all working. They are all producing code. 
they are all producing essentially work for the AppSec team, which is just four people, which again, you probably recognize is actually kind of a big team for that many developers. Uh, let's zoom in on the team. They probably look a little bit like this, a little bit unhappy about the amount of work that's coming in, all kinds of things, you know, the code changes, design reviews. Oh, I gotta keep up with CVEs and the bug bounty stuff and the reports from scans. And of course there's security incidents. And then there's the people who contact you as you ask them to, and they say, oh, I have a quick question for you. And then that's like half your day, which is fine. That's your job, but this is a lot of work. And they say, oh, what key size do you recommend for this encryption algorithm? And then you're like, wait, what are you encrypting? And <laughs> where, where were you gonna put those keys? Okay. So I have, this is just another view of the same thing, which I started calling the AppSec grind. I felt like it was just this grind that I was on um, where this work was coming in. I never felt like I had enough time and I didn't have enough people to get it done. And there was also a, another piece here, right? When you do your planning and you say, okay, next quarter or maybe next year, we're gonna do the work that's gonna have a big systemic impact at our company. Next quarter when we have more time. Next year when we have more time. And it feels like that is always coming and you don't have time to spend on it because of all of this. All right, so it's very obvious the AppSec team is too small. And the solution, I think you'll agree, is also obvious. Hire more. Yes, of course. We just need to hire more AppSec people. Yes. Some people are shaking their heads. No, I saw that. Okay. Uh, don't worry. Well, let's just play this through. Boom. Done. I think we recognize this is not realistic, right? No one has the budget for 96 AppSec engineers. Uh, where are you going to find 96 AppSec AppSec engineers that are going to work at your company in your geographic region, et cetera. Um, what's that? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Gosh. All right. Anyways, problem solved. Done. All right. Uh, this is a slide I stole from David Linder, and I guess he took it from Contrast Security, where he works. Uh, there are no numbers, but I've been told that there are numbers. They just won't share them or something. I don't know. But anyway, um, amount of code being created is going up very quickly. Uh, the budget for buying tools is going up not nearly as quickly, and the number of specialized security staff you can hire is barely going up at all. And the gap here is software security crisis. And I guess if I was from contrast, I would say buy our product. But anyways, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say something else. Uh, so people don't scale. We know people don't scale, but also hiring people doesn't scale because we can't hire enough people to handle the amount of work that needs to be done. So you may be thinking, boom, throw some automation on it. People don't scale, machines scale, problem solved. Well, um, I like several years ago, I would, totally would have agreed with you. In fact, I gave a talk with my colleagues, Neil Matal and Alex Smolin putting your robots to work, security automation at Twitter. Um, however, and this was uh, October 25th, uh, so almost exactly seven years ago. That was 2012. If we're still saying, oh, we just need to automate our work, first of all, you're like way behind if you haven't automated it. And secondly, we, that's not gonna solve the problem, right? We still have the same problem, just a little bit less of it. Um, and I also want to bring this up because sometimes I meet people and they say, oh, I loved your talk, um, putting your robots, you know, they don't remember the title, but you know, I loved your robots talk. And I go, oh, that's great. And they're like, yeah, we want to do something like that at our company. I say, that was 2012. <laughs> All right, um, okay. Let me just put my statement on the screen. Um, you can't automate everything. You can automate a bunch of things, and I have, I'm a big fan of automation, static analysis tools, et cetera. Um, but you can't automate everything. So this is what we say instead, right? Security is everyone's job. And I've said this, have you said this? Anyone here ever said this? Maybe, has, have you ever heard your friend say it? Yeah, your friend says it all the time, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I don't like this because who gets paged when there's a security issue? It's not everyone, <laughs> it's the security team because it's a security <laughs> issue. Um, so Matt Conda tweeted this uh, several years ago, 
uh, and he was quoting Michael Coates. And I like this because I know both of them. And so it makes me feel a connection to this as well as the quote makes a lot of sense. He said, the security team says no. In other words, you know, someone comes, hey, we want to like do this. No, 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 you can't do that. And they say no because they are incorrectly held accountable for all the flaws. So if they say, oh yeah, go do that. And then there's a security issue. Then the security team gets pulled in and they say, hey, security team, why didn't you make sure that this thing was secure before they went and did it? And you're like, oh, I just said, yes, go for it. And they're like, you're not doing your job then. Okay. <laughs> then I'm going to say no to everything. I mean, we recognize this as a fundamental problem in software security, right? Okay. So let's think about security is everyone's job. I think this may have more come from like physical security, right? Like you got to watch, if it's everybody's job. You got to watch out. Don't let people tailgate, et cetera. Uh, let's think about this deeper. Oh, sure. Even faster. Uh, okay. So I have my job. I spend a lot of time on this graphic. I have my job. I spend, let's say seven hours a day doing my job. And now you say security is also my job. Where do I do security? I got seven hour, again, I work seven hours a day, uh, one hour lunch and that's my eight hours. Um, where do I put in security? Also, I don't really get what security is. It's just this cloudy th thing in my mind. What does that mean? Security is my job, right? I guess I'll make sure to lap, like lock my laptop, done. Okay, let's look at some quotes. Um, so this was Gene Kim at LocomocoSec last year, 2018. He gave a talk about um, things that they discover since they discovered since writing the Phoenix project. Anyways, this is something that came out of their well, surveys that they do, and it says high performers, meaning high performing companies, uh, because they are integrating information security objectives into everyone's daily work, are spending half as much time remediating security issues. That sounds like good stuff. Uh, I want that. Uh, a white hat security report from last year, organizations that successfully embed security into DevOps experience a 50% drop in their production vulnerabilities and their time to fix improves by 25%. Also sounds like good stuff. Um, the DevOps handbook says in high performing organizations, quality availability and security aren't the responsibility of individual departments, but are a part of everyone's job every day. And now at this point, you're thinking, oh, this is a DevSecOps talk. I should have known it. That guy knew it. That guy knew it. All right. Um, I don't want you to think this is a DevSecOps talk. That's not exactly what it is. But I was reading the DevOps handbook that I quoted on the last slide. And I, I was thinking, this, um, there's something here that I think is being missed when we're talking about DevSecOps because most DevSecOps is automation in the pipeline and we already covered that that's not gonna solve all our problems. All right, moving on. Hey, there it is. Okay, so let's think about like why DevOps, why DevOps became a thing, why, why has it become this buzzword that's everywhere? Um, I didn't have animation, shame on me. Well, anyways. Uh, the idea of, uh, okay, from my understanding, my perspective, et cetera, uh, th the problem uh, that gave rise to DevOps was this idea that, okay, we have our developers, 96 of them, and we have our operations team. The developers write the code, they package it up in some form, maybe a jar file, I don't know, and then they hand it over to the operations team to deploy and run in production. And in between there's a wall because they just go, hey, operations team, you take care of this. And then what would happen if something happened in production, who got paged? Not the developers, the operations team because the operation team was running production, right? Um, similar thing with QA. Okay, I write my code and then I hand it over to the QA team. They will test it for me. And eventually they'll, you know, they'll come back with some reports that I discard or whatever. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I th and I feel a similar thing with DBA teams, uh, database administration teams where they're like, hey, I need to make some changes to the database or I need to create a new database or add a table or something like that. Um, let me like open a ticket for the DBA team and they will do the work for me and I'm, I'm basically separated from it. 
Um, hey, wait, isn't that kind of like the AppSec team too? Like developers write the code and then they say, hey, can you make sure this is secure? Can you like put your stamp of security on this code that I'm going to ship or this feature I'm going to design, et cetera? It feels like exactly the same thing. Uh, what's the problem with walls? Walls can be good, right? Walls are secure. I don't know. I, sorry, that, I just ad-libbed that one. Okay, uh, the, the problem with walls. Well, first of all, you can't see through them. That's a problem with a wall. You can't see what the other teams are doing. You don't have an understanding of what's going on. Uh, I feel this a lot when it's like, uh, I, it's like, oh, can you open a ticket for that team? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, okay, I can create a ticket. I don't understand the options and the drop downs because I don't know how that team works. I don't know how they're going to handle the ticket. I don't know the time frame. Like, I don't know how they work because they're on the other side of the wall, right? Another thing with walls is that you have this problem where you're here and they're over there. And so again, it's this sort of lack of understanding. I also want to note, there's no clocks in front of me and I didn't set a timer. So if someone wants to be like, hey, you're like way behind. Who do I even look at? Nobody's waving at me. All right, I'm just gonna go. And then I'm sorry for the people after me. That's it? Wow, all right, anyways. Uh, there's a problem with consistency because things over here are not like the things over there. Uh, it takes a long time for things to go over walls and comes back, come back and long feedback cycles are bad. Big thing, big problem with walls and security, I believe, is this transfer of responsibility. When you send it over the wall, it is no longer your problem. And if we're saying developers send your stuff, your code, your whatever over the wall to the AppSec team, they go, oh, the AppSec team, they must be in charge of application security. Therefore, I am not in charge of it because there's a team called application security who's in charge of it. And I think that's really the big problem. All right. Uh, so let's go through, well, I'll try to go through this somewhat quickly. Let's just, uh, let me remind you what we're trying to think of here, which is AppSec team has too much work. Uh, things are thrown over the wall to us from the development side. That's a lot like uh, dev and ops. That's a lot like dev and QA. That's a lot like dev and DBA. So what happened with those teams uh, with, let's say, the rise of DevOps? All right, so what is operations as everyone's job look like? Well, first of all, you have infrastructure as code. And I think, what's my next point? Yeah, okay. So uh, you have to like cast your mind back, I think, a little bit. Now imagine you're someplace, uh, I don't know. I don't know the time frame. Um, you're at a place and you're like, okay, I need a server for this thing I'm gonna deploy. Okay, let me open a ticket for, I don't know, IT or operations or something. I want a server, I don't know, this size, this operating system, whatever. And then they would go and, I don't know, find a box somewhere and like put hardware in it and then install an operating system and then like click through a bunch of screens to like set it up the way you want it set up. And then eventually they would be like, hey, I did the thing, here's a server for you to use. That's not the way things are done today, right? Now you like write a script and you like click some buttons and then boom, you have a server somewhere in the cloud. That's a big change. And now operations is not that person's job over there. You do it as just part of your work, right? Oh, I need to update a server. I need a new server. I need a certain new service. You write some code and uh, you can do it yourself. Deployments are automatic or on demand, not here, operations team, here's our jar file, please deploy it. New environments on demand, new services on demand, and also alerts, logs, and metrics are kind of open to everyone. It's not, oh, the operations team monitors all our metrics. No, just about everybody can log in and, and view the logs or metrics or whatever and monitor them. What does QA as everyone's job look like? I'm sorry, let me go back to this one more second, just to, uh, try to drive this home. So again, this has gone from let me open a ticket for someone who's going to like do some manual work to I'm just gonna click some buttons or write a little bit of code and click some buttons. Now it's everyone's job, but it's not in the sense of like, oh, now I have to go find a box somewhere, right? No, it's, it's been made into a process that I can just do myself. And now it's part of my job, but it's not like a big part of my job, it's just click, click, done, or roughly. All right, QA is, QA is everyone's job, you know, test-driven development, or at least the concept of developers write the test. 
that makes sense because developers write the code, they write the tests, they understand the code, they understand the tests to write. It makes a lot of sense, right? Huh, okay. Um, yeah, this is like DevOps stuff, okay. Um, feature flags, oh, I like this one. So the idea of like, okay, we have feature flags, like turn things on and off in production and control what, like, what cohorts can see what features and so on. Hey, we can turn it on for everyone in our company. Now all of our employees are QA people. Huh. It's literally become, it depends on your product, of course, but let's assume your product is something most of the people in the company can use on a daily basis. Now QA has become part of everyone's job. It's not like an extra thing. It's just something you do as part of your daily work. And if you find a problem, you open a ticket or whatever, right? Okay, uh, DBA, I think you kind of get the idea, but you know, uh, the databases just magically happen. Uh, the schema lives in the code, not someone logging into a machine and clicking around in the GUI or whatever, right? Um, yep, yeah, automated metrics serve. I don't know why I put this on this slide, but yeah, metrics are available, visible to everyone, okay. All right, so what if we wanna make security like those other things? It's not just automate stuff in the pipeline, okay? We're past that. Um, all right, so this is what I came up with. The work that the application security team does in order for it to become everyone's job, uh, one of three things needs to happen to it. Um, one, it needs to, it could disappear. Um, I, I think, you know, infrastructure as code is a way of like a, a big chunk of work just disappearing, right? It's just gone, you don't see it anymore. Uh, be integrated into developers daily work. This is more like QA, right? You know, your tests, you write your tests as part of your daily work. It's not, um, it's not seen as someone else's job. It's just like, oh, this is part of what I do. I write tests with my code and the code and everything is better for it. If you can't do those two things, um, the things that I tend to think of as kind of left over is like, okay, stuff happens in production, uh, stuff fails, I don't know, intrusion attempts, whatever. Um, that should be turned into alerts, right? That we, we need to have some uh, safety net on the outside. We need alerts. Uh, but they need to be actionable alerts, of course. And if even better is like self-remediating alerts, if you can do that. Uh, okay. So as I said at the beginning, I'm not going to stand up here and give you a solution to all the problems that I just mentioned, uh, because this is something I am working on. And this is something that I just, I just want us to think about. So these following slides are not, I'm telling you how to do this. This is just, okay, when I thought about, here's the, here's the issue, here's what I see as uh, the end state that I wanna be in, how can we get there? So just some suggestions, depends on your organization, et cetera, et cetera, these may be bad. Uh, okay, how do, we get, how do we make security disappear? Uh, how about, and, okay, so here's a security job. Uh, I see a CVE. Oh no, we need to update our libraries. Which libraries? How many libraries? How many applications are using these libraries? What versions are they using? How do I find all of them? How do I get the developers to update all of them? That is work that needs to disappear. And one way that can disappear is that we just always update all the time. And now that work is effectively disappeared other than of course when updates break things and so on. But the main part of the work has disappeared. Uh, okay, yeah. Operating level, operating system level library, or like not application library, other like system level libraries. Hey, let's just always deploy on fully patched systems. Yes, this requires, all this requires like strong, good test suites, et cetera, of course. We understand that as part of DevOps. Um, yeah, so let's just always patch all our systems. Why ever deploy on anything old? Yes, I know compatibility. Okay, um, security built into our frameworks and libraries. Of course we need that. Please use AP, build or use APIs that are secure by default. If you hand someone an API and then you say, oh, but if you wanna be secure, you gotta pass in this extra flag. Okay, we're gonna get that wrong like all the time, right? So please APIs that are secure by default. When, once it's secure by default, now the work disappears, right? And now you can just write an automated rule that says, hey, tell me when anyone doesn't use the default and then you're good to go. Okay, yeah, same thing, right? I shouldn't be able to deploy to an environment that has known vulnerabilities in, let's say it's system libraries or whatever. Uh, oh yeah, this was a tweet from not too long ago. Um, 
Uh, it says, so this just happened. A bot found a vulnerability in a dependency. A bot sent a PR to fix it. The CI verified the PR. A bot merged it. And then a bot celebrated the merge. Boom. <laughs> All right, so this is, I don't know, a look at the future, I don't know. Some people got upset about this, but I, I think it's, um, it's a glimpse into where we should be thinking about going. If we're not already there yet, like this repo clearly is. Okay, what about integrating security into people's daily work? Um, okay, code reviews are something that, for some reason, get put on the AppSec team's plate that makes no sense, okay? unless you work at a company that only produces like five lines of code a day or something, right? How can you ever review all the code that's being uh, put, like deployed? You can't. Um, how can, if, even if you could, do you have the context to review that code in a security context outside of like some injection problems or cross-site scripting? No, you probably don't. Remember the wall and the non-locality? This is part of the problem. All right, so I think it would be nice uh, code reviews. Go ahead, have a security checklist. You can do this with GitHub's um, pull request templates. Put in a security checklist. Who does the checklist? The peer reviewer on the code review. Are you a peer of the development team? No, you are not because of the wall. Well, anyways, not because of the wall, but because you're not working in the code every day. A peer is someone who's on the same team or a nearby team who can actually review the code with context. That's who should be doing the code review. Getting developers, to, I hate the term threat model, but we all know what it means, uh, to do that on their own. Uh, security tests in this test suite. So again, this is like, remember, this isn't invisible work. This is just like, oh, work that is now part of my daily workflow and it's not really disruptive to me. It's just another thing that I do. Yep, automated, or here's our automation one line in this whole presentation automation all right that's good for me all right uh oh yeah this is what i said appsec team is not peers uh, if you read let's say the devops handbook it says that code should be peer. it has a whole page on how like the security team is not a peer of the development teams because of not having the context um security alerts yes anyways they should be actionable uh they should go to the responsible developers i do understand that there's like um a gap between like what we have today as security alerts or security notices or even results from bug buddy and tests and something that can actually be handed to a developer i understand that but we're thinking 10 years in the future so let's just go to the responsible developers okay uh review this is the like all the stuff the opsec team has to do how can we get rid of this team just an example, just a thought exercise. Here's where these responsibilities could live. And I don't necessarily mean you say, hey, this is your responsibility now. 10 minutes? Oh, fine. All right, thank you. Um, I don't mean you say, here, developers, this is your job now. Um, I'm thinking more like somebody on that team with security expertise, but let's say embedded on the team, just one idea. Um, because we want the work to be done on teams that, you know, they're doing that work, right? So just an example, we already talked about developers a whole lot. Um, if you have like a platform or developer tools team, hey, that's a good place for automation of tools, um, security alerts, writing secure libraries. So instead of having, oh, AppSec team is gonna do those things, how about the team that already does those things gets help from an AppSec engineer or someone with AppSec expertise, right? Um, oh yeah, I, it, why does the security team manage incidents? We're not like managers of things, right? We provide security expertise. Your company probably has a team or in the future will have a team that just manages incidents, that's all they do. So let them manage the incidents. Um, I don't know, maybe this is more specific to my experience, but it makes more sense that there's a team that manages incidents. They, this is what they do, this is what they do all the time. They have a process, they know how to contact people, they know who, who to contact, they know how to manage it, report it, all that stuff. Let them do it, provide expertise. Okay, I don't know, we can outsource training and pen testing maybe, I don't know, just an example. 
Now, I want to be very honest with you. I'm a very honest person, and you know that because I just told you. Um, this is everything on that list except for triaging of pen test results and creating security champions. Um, why didn't I put triage penetration test results on? Because people get really upset about that because they know that you can't just hand that to a developer. You know, everyone talks about the like thousand page PDF, et cetera. We know we can't do that. But in the future, maybe those get turned into something that actually a developer can understand. And I don't mean that like developers can't understand things, but when I get something I don't understand, how much time am I going to spend like thinking about it, right? It's like, oh, here's this all this work that is outside of my workflow that now I have to do. Anyways, uh, that's why I didn't put it on the list, but I think in the future, I don't know, something will be, get better there. Uh, can developers create security champions themselves? That doesn't really make sense. However, uh, I also think that maybe security champions doesn't make any sense. Here is why, don't get upset. Um, when you say this person on the, your development team, that's your security champion, everyone else on the team gets to go, ah, good, they're in charge of security. We just have the same problem just at a smaller scale, right? So I think everyone should be a security champion. Okay. Anyways, but you get the idea, right? Okay, so end of the AppSec team. To get there, AppSec must be distributed across the organization, the responsibilities, et cetera, kind of as I showed on that slide. Of course, we have to do automation. Of course, we have to do automation. Um, and then AppSec must be democratized. And I don't mean that everyone gets to vote about AppSec. Uh, that's what I thought democratized meant. Uh, what it means is that it is accessible to everyone. Everyone is able to um, partake in it. Everyone is able to do their share of that. And this is, I, I think of like, um, I don't know, having access to logs in Splunk. Um, okay, if that's locked down and only the ops team can access the logs, then they have to do the work, right? Democratizing it would mean everyone, okay, let's say everyone in the engineering organization has access to logs. Now you've democratized access to it. Everyone has the ability, they are enabled to go and look at logs. Right? Just as an example. So AppSec needs to be made the same way. It can't be, oh, that is the expertise of those people over there. And therefore, uh, you know, they do that. I do my development work and we're separated that way. No, it has to be democratized. Uh, in order to reach the end state, which I am advocating for, which is getting rid of the AppSec team. All right, uh, just a reminder, uh, the work that is currently done by application security teams needs to either disappear, be integrated into developers daily work as we talked about. And again, that means just like the way writing tests or deploying servers uh, has been worked into developers daily work, or it needs to be actionable alerts that you can respond to as, uh, as an expert on your piece of whatever the application is rather than as a security expert. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to take this out. But anyways, um, I think a couple things as security, mostly security professionals that we really need to think about um, spending some time on is one, contribute to securing frameworks and libraries. Um, I think it's 2019, almost 2020, no excuse for new web frameworks to come out without all this controls that we're used to, CSERF prevention, um, cross-site scripting prevention, parameterized queries, like why, right? Um, and you th may think I'm joking, but no, I've seen uh, people go, hey, check out my new templating library. Oh, what did you do about escaping HTML? Why would I need to escape HTML? What does that mean? Okay, we gotta get involved and help. Um, and then I think, you know, every now and then I, I try to pretend that I'm, have no security expertise or very little and I try to go and learn about like some security issue like an AppSec issue I don't know cross-site scripting something like that or maybe something less well explained like CSERF or a server-side request forgery something like that and I look at the documentation that we have the materials that we have to explain it and I feel like they're lacking and I, I'm not trying to like criticize any particular resource 
Um, but I do feel like if you just kind of put yourself in, a, I'm a developer, but and I want to learn about this, but I don't have much background. I think it's pretty dense material that doesn't necessarily explain what the problem is, how to fix it, that kind of thing. So think about maybe ways that we as a collective can contribute to helping developers be better educated on security. I know, you know, OWASP has been saying that forever and been, uh, been a goal, but I really do think this is a problem. Actually, the materials out there are not sufficient for developers today. And if we're gonna get to a state where we don't have an AppSec team, this knowledge needs to be spread to everyone. Okay, all right. Anyways, end of the AppSec team. Um, President Beef on the internet, presidentbeef.com, you can find um, these slides, which I pulled off of that site for this presentation. Um, all, all my talks and videos and stuff are there, including these ones if you'd like to reference them. And I'm probably plenty out of time now, so thank you very much. No questions? I, who's, well, sorry, I was actually asking, is there time for questions or should we, should we do questions while the next presenter? Ah, there you are. What should I, what should I do? Okay, yes. Can you expand on your opinion of the term threat model? Uh, can I expand on my opinion of the term threat model? I don't know, I feel like, I feel like it's just like something you say and it's like, oh, threat model and you're like, oh, like I, I don't know, I, I just, <laughs> It just bothers me for some reason. It's like too formal, let's say, you know, whereas really what we want people to do is, hey, can you think about the security of what you're building for a second? And can you think about ways it may be abused? Um, ways, you know, how sensitive is the data that you're collecting? Uh, how, how are you planning on, you know, like I, I just don't feel like it conveys what we want it to convey uh, or what I want it to convey. And it conjures up in my mind very formal, very boring processes, and no one's going to adopt something like that. Do I have a better term? No, I, I don't. That's why I put it on the slides, because I, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't come up with a better term. I haven't really even spent time on it. I guess I just expressed my displeasure and hope that someone else will come up with a better term. If they haven't already, maybe you have one. No, okay. All right. Other questions? Yes. experience with um, maybe some of the issues that'll come about with uh, the shared computing power like so like Golem where you can have uh, a bunch of different I guess offline computers that are gonna allow for people to um, not have to go and you know get servers or or whatever have you seen any have you dealt with any issues that are gonna arise from security issues from shared computing that sounds like something you know more about than I do oh okay <laughs> Sorry. No, no. Yes, yes. Uh, the microphone's right behind you there. So, I mean, a lot of what you talked about has this long-term vision, which is great, something I'd love to chat about. Uh, is there anything in this forum that's kind of like, what's your short-term, what what's reachable straight away? Um, so, uh, mm. How to say without sharing too much information. <laughs> so I feel like um, in past roles, um, I went in thinking, well, two things. Uh, early on, I didn't have any concept of like long-term plan, right? It was like, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna do AppSec stuff, right? And I think a lot of people are in that mode. Uh, I'm just gonna like find vulnerabilities, fix vulnerabilities, um, does, review stuff as it comes up, be a resource for the company as things come up. Um, and then after that, I was like, oh, I know what to do. We just need to automate things and, uh, you know, I don't know, get some training, whatever. And what I didn't take into account was that every company is different. Every company has a different culture. And this is a long way of saying it depends on your organization. Okay, um, I do still feel that automation is a quick, easy win, especially if you can do things to get insight into uh, the code that's shipping, if you can get um, alerting about issues that you know you have, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, if you ask me in a, a next, like in a year from now, I might have a better answer for you. Um, but I think it, okay, let me, give, let me give you a better answer. Short term, sit down, 
take a step back, think about the work you're doing or that your team is doing and think about how you can not do that anymore, right? And still have a security assurance. <laughs> All right. Uh, just, were there any questions? Sorry, I, because I felt like I, I, I didn't want to ignore this side of the room. Was there a question over here that I can answer as I walk off? Okay, one question. The question that I have is uh, for a team to start doing security checklist, do you have any suggestion on or recommendation on where a team can actually start accumulating that security checklist? based on their application they're writing, what is a good starting point for a team, say they're writing some API spec and then they're writing some API program. And then what is a good starting point for a team that want to get started doing this kind of things? Okay, um, so I think OWASP has excellent resources for that. I mean, you can start with top 10 lists, you can start with, uh, was it app applicate, yes, thank you, application security verification standard, which has like way too much information but it is very detailed. But going back to how I answered this gentleman's question, I, I think you have, if you have the information about uh, bug bunny reports you've had, security incidents you've had, uh, pen test results that you have that show consistent problems, attack those problems, right? Uh, but I would recommend keeping it short, like less than 10 items, and then link it to resources that expand on that. Okay, thank you. Well, everyone give them a round of applause. Thank you, Justin. Um, hopefully this microphone is just as loud, so I'd like to invite Katie up now. Uh, Katie's our next speaker. Um, I'll just comment very quickly on the, the reason why people were so annoyed about the dependency bumping thing. It was basically in a dev dependency, which would never have reached user input, so people were like, ugh! It may have, it may have got rid of a prototype pollution vulnerability, but it's not really that much problematic. So. Hopefully I don't steal some of your intro, but Katie is about to talk to us about time sh the time sharing problem. But before Katie talks about time, let's talk about compost or compost, however you want to pronounce it. So Katie is a compost ed educator and that sounds quite interesting. Can you tell us all one interesting thing about compost before we begin? Um, oh my gosh, probably the coolest kind of composting is worm composting. Uh, vermicomposting is like wild because of the stuff that goes on in their guts and like in their slime like it actually kills E. coli and like other bacteria like they can decompose a dead body that died of like a really nasty contagious disease and then produce this like really wonderful rich totally sanitary stuff that you can like put on your vegetables oh okay we don't need anything else <laughs> Um, so thank you, uh, Katie, I'll pass it on to you now, but I actually live near the sunset, so I'm going to come and put some dead bodies in there. If you live near the sunset, you should come to Garden for the Environment, which is where we learn to compost and we teach people to compost. Um, well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Murphy. That is my real email address, um, and that is also my real blog. Um, hi, Eric, thanks. Um, that's my team hanging out in the back. They're really supportive and wonderful. Um, so this talk came about, does this work? Oh yes, I was going the wrong direction. Um, this talk came about because I was pretty sick of uh, hearing things like, oh, it's in a container, so it's secure. Or, oh, we're in Kubernetes, so we're good. Um, because that's just really silly. Has anyone seen that in real life or in Twitter? Like, not <laughs> two hands in the back. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, what actually are the levers available to us uh, from just containers, either built yourself or through the many ways over the years that they have uh, been made for you. Uh, and Kubernetes, because there are other uh, orchestration platforms, but that is the one I know from Google land. So uh, I'm not just a, a compost educator at Garden for the Environment. I am also a friend of the urban forest. So you can come out and plant trees um, and it's really fun when it's not the summer. Um, that is my fur baby, and she is the best. Um, and I am a cloud security engineer at Segment. I think we're hiring. Are we hiring? Yes. Cool, yeah, we're hiring. Uh, so why talk about the history of it? Uh, when I was in school and they taught me stuff that was physics and you didn't necessarily need to know the history, it was just really useful context to learn about the way that the thinking has evolved on such a subject. Um, but the physical world is also different, right? Like this is something that we built, um, which is why computer science is a really weird science. Um, 
So, whoop, do I need to, I'm hearing feedback. Um, and this is really good context because especially if you're from a legacy company that's had things for a really long time, cough, Facebook, uh, you might actually have built a container out of all the component parts and updated your base operating system, but never quite made it to the modern orchestration or containerization platforms. But all these things are still available to you. Um, and if you go to my blog, localhost.network, uh, there's a little bit of profiling that I didn't include here that might be useful to you, but honestly, spoilers, it's not super awesome or helpful. Uh, these things are really hard. So hold on to your butts, because we're starting in 1953. So what is the time sharing problem? Uh, we've had computers that actually worked since 1890, um, but they're big and expensive. And even as late as like the 50s and 60s, they were taking up whole rooms. But they're, since they're huge, powerful, and expensive, we need to make use of these resources more efficiently. Uh, and in the limit, when you have cloud hosting providers, you want to make really efficient use of them and then charge people prices that are attractive and still run things on them relatively securely. So uh, the whole issue essentially that we've been trying to solve in various POSIX compliant kernels has been, how can you do this safely and just offer people you know, in the limit a Lambda function and assert that it is secure? Um, so essentially, there are two ways to accomplish this. One of them is more heavyweight uh, and one is, as we'll see, more lightweight. Uh, and both of these were being thought about, or the, the place where they split directions was about 1963. So in virtualization, we're running entire separate operating systems. Uh, but the way that containers have gone is that we're sharing resources through a single kernel rather than having a hypervisor run many kernels and many full operating system stacks. Uh, so there was an MIT professor named Fernando Corbato who first started thinking about this uh, in the 50s and finished the first time-sharing system in 1961. Um, meanwhile, IBM, going the hypervisor route, finished their first hypervisor in 1966, and it was to run on their mainframes. So what is a hypervisor? We're just going to cover that real quick and then mostly dive into the single shared kernel space. Uh, a hypervisor is the software uh, well, it's one of the pieces of software that emulates and mediates access to hardware resources, uh, what we call like the bare metal. So uh, we say there are two types of hypervisors, although like functionally they're not super different. Type one is just a very lean OS. So it's what you think of as like uh, running KVM on Linux, for example, or I believe there are other, you know, hardware specific uh, like, you know, things that you can rack and stack. And then type two is if you think of like in a development environment where you're running something on VirtualBox and then you're developing in a virtual machine, but you can still use like your Mac or whatever is running it uh, for other things like browsing the internet. So um, one of the beautiful things about this is that uh, whole virtual machines, like nothing shares anything. They don't interact with each other. There aren't the same users. There aren't the same file systems. And all the hypervisor has to do is just like carve up access to the hardware resources and just like share it out between them. Um, but the problem with this is when you're running entire operating systems, this gets very heavy. So if you're talking about a context like uh, a shared hosting provider, this is very expensive. This is not very attractive. Um, so I want to also define what is a kernel in case like people don't have a super great grasp on that. Um, it's just the core software of an operating system and that includes hypervisors because what it does is mediate access to the hardware because something has to do that or your computer's just not gonna run, right? So the part that actually does that, it's called the kernel. Um, so some examples of things it has control over, uh, starting up the whole rest of the operating system, which is just a collection of other software, uh, managing processes and physical memory and peripheral devices and uh, IO on various buses or your hard drive and things like this. Uh, and then I also want to define a syscall. Um, essentially, when you're moving between user mode and kernel mode, uh, where you know the kernel is what's mediating access to everything and like starting all these sort of low level things for you, and then user mode is running like uh, other things like your browser, for example, um, it's the user space program is requesting access to the underlying low level resources through a system call. And that's system call cat, kernel cat and user space cat are passing system calls. Um, and then essentially what's happening is called a context switch. You're switching context from the user mode to the kernel mode and back. Um, so we mentioned earlier that um, creating, well, I didn't put it here. 
Um, but creating and opening files, for example, uh, is something that it requires the kernel to do. So the user space process say, Chrome wants to like download a file and it'll like context switch and say like, I wanna create this file and the kernel will go like here, let me create that and pass you back the file handle. Um, or I wanna create a new process, uh, like gonna continue the browser analogy, like an extension or an app. So it'll say, create me the new process, cool. Um, sending and receiving network packets, uh, handling you know uh, network interface cards and passing packets over them is also a low level operation that requires a context switch, uh, et cetera. Okay, so we're gonna skip past, or we covered virtualization. We're gonna talk now about uh, time sharing operating systems that we're focusing on sharing a single kernel. So um, Bell Labs uh, had a, a couple of really brilliant engineers for writing operating systems uh, named Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. You may have heard of their names. Um, so in 1964, they started a project that was in collaboration with GE, later Honeywell, and MIT. So the same guy that wrote the experimental uh, time sharing operating system, who incidentally also invented passwords and like several other really important computing concepts. Uh, they were all working together on this time sharing operating system. Uh, and we're gonna talk about two concepts they had that were um, particularly influential to security or significant to security, but they had many more that were just influential to computing generally. Um, so we're gonna quickly cover ring oriented security and discretionary access control. So ring-oriented security, that's, uh, that's kernel cat running in ring zero. Um, <laughs> um, it's basically a hardware control around uh, what code is allowed to run where. I probably should have put a picture of a CPU up here. Uh, but they store values in something called a register. So essentially, um, there, are, there are like many more rings than are actually used. We generally say that like the kernel runs in ring zero and then the user space runs in ring three. Um, uh, I think there are some hypervisors that made use of rings one and two, but essentially it means that like something running in user space can't just directly access values in the register of the kernel space. Like it's literally physically mediated. So uh, an example was like if you had spyware that was running in a user land program, it can't just like do a thing that the kernel needed to mediate access to, such as turn on the webcam or create a file without um, informing the user. Um, and yeah, web browsers, for example, have to request access to the network in a lower numbered ring. But this is just referring to where it's running on the hardware. Obviously the operating system can just allow this to happen. Um, but something you're probably more familiar with is discretionary access control. Like if you think of like, you know, Chmod 777 or Chmod 600 or something like the read, write, execute permission for like users, groups and global, um, that's what discretionary access control means. Um, and the reason it's called discretionary is because there's still a root user who can do anything. Uh, and an individual user can like change the permissions on a file that they own if they are the owner. So, um, and this was like the technical definition, a means of restricting access to objects based on the identity of the subjects. Um, so it's, it's downfall for the purposes that we will talk about later is that uh, the user that owns it can extend their access. And this is not necessarily great. Okay, so the Unix wars. Um, Bell Labs, uh, I did not mention it here, but they were sued twice by the government, I think, um, because they were um, not a monopoly, but essentially they were not allowed, they were in like, they had their fingers in too many pies and uh, there was like a federal case that was like, look, if you invent anything outside of like technology related to telecom, you have to license that. So they were like, oh crap, that means we can't sell Multics. Um, so they pulled out, GE Honeywell later wound up selling it. Um, the last time I gave this talk, somebody actually had like programmed on that. Um, so uh, the thing is that the developers within Bell Labs working on other projects had been using Multics and they really liked it. And they really liked the suite of tools that was running on it. It was like very like useful and pleasant to develop on. Um, so when they pulled out, Thompson and Richie were like, oh, well, I guess we can just like write something really similar just so the developers are happy. Um, so I believe Richie had just written the language C. So um, not all of Multics was written in C, although I believe it was the first um, operating system that had at least components written in a higher level language rather than just assembly. Um, so it was very portable, but now they rewrote Unix, a Multics clone, which was supposed to be one of whatever Multics was many of, uh, and they wrote it entirely in C. So it was like the first completely portable operating system 
uh, and they distributed it internally. And then when it was done, they went and they gave a talk about it uh, at a conference in 1973 and everybody uh, in universities were like, we wanna use this. So they distributed it. They would like send them like the, the discs in the mail with a note that was like, with love, Kim Thompson. I wish I had a photo of that. Um, then Thompson takes a sabbatical to Berkeley and this is actually where BSD, the operating system comes from. Um, it was originally like OS2 or something like this. Um, but it did take a lot of concepts and a lot of code um, from Unix. So um, Unix was not open source. It was free because they were not legally allowed to make money on it, but it was not open source. Um, so Thompson and some grad students are working on BSD. They're slowly changing out all the code that is proprietary uh, with code that is not. Um, meanwhile, some schmuck over at MIT named Richard Stallman starts the Free Software Foundation. Um, he wanted to have an operating system and a suite of tools that was basically the same in academia, but was open source, like truly open source. Um, so they managed to get enough developers to write all of the tools, like all of the main tools that were popular in Unix, um, but they never get anyone to finish the kernel, which was called Herd. Um, meanwhile, uh, BSD actually gets uh, accused of taking too much code from Unix and they get sued, so it loses a lot of like development momentum. Uh, which is sort of unfortunate. Um, but right around the same time, Linus Torvalds uh, writes a clone of this. Um, oh, sorry, there's also someone who writes uh, Minix, which is also not open source at the time. It is now um, for the purposes of a textbook. It's also a Unix clone. Um, but at this point, since there's no actual, in 1991, there's no actual free and open source Unix clone, uh, Linus Torvalds writes one. And I can't find his quote, but I believe he's on the record as saying that if BSD had not been sued, um, Linux probably never would have gotten written, which would be an interesting alternate universe. Um, oh, sorry, this is out of order. Um, I've heard people call Chirrut a security feature. It's not, but people have been trying to use it as a security feature ever since it came out as a syscall. Um, I believe originally people's like network exposed services like FTP, they were like, oh, let me just Chirrut it and that's fine. Um, but if you look at the man page, it's like, please do not do this. There are several ways of breaking out of this. It is not good. Um, and this is a cat breaking out of Chirrut. Um, yeah, I think the main ways to break out of it are that uh, you can just, whatever the directory is, if it's moved, um, then suddenly like you are now out of it. Um, and when you call it, you have to actually also change the directory. If you don't, you're just out of it and it's just not helpful. Um, it turns out the thing Chirrut's really good for is isolating um, build dependencies. So you should definitely use it for that, um, but definitely don't use it for security. There are better, better ways. Okay, so the government has been using computers since literally 1890, right? But it wasn't until the 80s uh, that they were like, wait a minute, we actually need to like consider what like level of security is necessary to run very important government things on our computers. Um, so they had a whole like rainbow of books with a bunch of criteria for government stuff, but the orange book in particular was about um, how to establish or how to rank uh, security on an operating system, the uh, trusted computer system evaluation criteria. So uh, they evaluated multics and it was a class B2 where it's kind of like letter grades, right? So A would be better, B2 is not bad. Um, but this was, oh yeah, this was later become the NSA. They were like, well, could we do better? Um, so they did, they actually wrote their own operating system uh, and they had a control framework that they were like, okay, this is great, but no one's gonna write code for our operating system. So they were like, okay, how do we make all of these controls work on a more popular operating system? So that was in 1992, uh, Linux picked up steam really fast, like within a few years. So they started working on a kernel patch that would implement mandatory access control rather than discretionary access control. Uh, and it was called Security Enhanced Linux. And if you actually man SE Linux, uh, you will see in the first line, this is uh, the NSA's SE Linux. Uh, and this is, in case this wasn't clear, you can't implement like controls for things like this anywhere but the kernel. Like you can't write this in user land. If you want the capability to exist to mediate access to something, it has to be in the kernel because that's what the kernel does. Okay, so mandatory access control. Um, some uh, grad student actually had a similar idea uh, a couple years before the NSA, well, while they were developing it, but before it was announced. Uh, 
So they started working on a, a program that later becomes AppArmor. Uh, and then they later get acquired by, um, uh, I'm blanking, but it's the company that is still associated now with Ubuntu, um, which is why you see AppArmor. Yes, Canonical, thank you. Um, which is why AppArmor is still the uh, kind of pre-compiled associated uh, LSM with Ubuntu and Debian. Um, so the NSA presents SE Linux at the Linux kernel summit, but Crispin Corbin is there and is like, wait a minute, like why would we want the NSA to just directly commit their code to the kernel? Uh, this is not cool. And Linus Torvalds is like, I really don't wanna deal with this. I think we should just make a general framework so that people could choose on their own. Um, so it takes three years, everybody agrees, they work on this as a community, uh, but now everyone has to rewrite their stuff as not a direct patch, but as something that works with the, uh, the hooks for LSMs that have just been developed. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't write the difference here, but essentially AppArmor works more on like path-based, on defining like what is allowed to touch what based on where it lives in the file system, uh, whereas SE Linux is this label-based system like by inode, so it's a little bit more precise um, Neither of them are super fun to profile, but AppArmor is a little bit easier because uh, the, it's like a less sophisticated system. I don't know if it was ever rated by the Orange Book, but it is uh, less secure than SE Linux. Um, and then there are technically two more, uh, Smack and Tomoyo. Has anyone ever even heard of those? Apparently it's used in embedded Linux systems. Um, so let's see, this is all happening around like 2000, 2002, right? Um, Meanwhile, I couldn't find who implemented this. Um, in 1999, uh, we have someone working on capabilities. So when things are running as root uh, or running with like pseudo privileges, um, it bypasses all kernel permission checks because it's already running in kernel space. So this makes root or anything running as root a really juicy attack surface. Um, there's reasons to do this, right? Like if you actually need any of these things that um, like require elevating your privilege. So binding to a low numbered port is a good example. Uh, ping, I didn't realize till I looked into this, is also a good example because you have to use um, the raw network interface. So the idea of capabilities is why did we pool all of these permissions behind just one user? Couldn't we just break those up? Um, so capabilities breaks them out individually, although there's also some combinations such as cap sysadmin. Um, so try this at home. You can run get cap on a binary and see what capabilities it runs with, with any, uh, if any, uh, and you can run set cap on something. So if you wanted to run a uh, set cap, um, like bind net raw, you can like bind to a low numbered port. Um, and this is great, do this at home. Like try this at home, do this at home. Um, around the same time, all of this is happening. Um, Ken Thompson, yes, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie have moved on to writing their third major operating system called Plan 9, um, which is based on Plan 9 from Outer Space by uh, Ed Wood, and their logo is Glenda, from Glenn, not Glenda. Um, so every time they're building a new operating system, they're like uh, thinking more about security and doing new cool stuff. So uh, for Plan 9, their thought, well, first of all, it was distributed, which is like a whole separate, not particularly security-related thought, uh, but their security-related thought that was very cool was, what if we gave every user and every process their own view of the operating system, their own non-intersecting view? Uh, and they called it namespaces. And you can still read the docs online, even though I don't think Plan 9 is actively maintained anymore. Um, so essentially every global system resource, it's like wrapping it in an abstraction so that you think you're in your own, you know, oh, like I have root or I just, I can see everything, but you can't. Um, so 2002 is when the first namespace was implemented. Right now we're at seven, and I think the full thought was that we were gonna go with 13, uh, but so far seven has been enough for us to implement containers as we know them today. Um, the mount namespace was the first one, um, but we also needed the user namespace, uh, the PID namespace, uh, the namespace that tells you what you think the operating system is, uh, the network namespace, et cetera. And then seccomp, this was such a cool thought. Um, this business never took off though. In 2005, someone named Ardre Andrea Archangeli thought, wouldn't it be great if you could just sell unused CPU cycles on other people's machines to just run arbitrary code? Wait a minute, that's terrifying. How do we actually do that in a not terrifying way? So the point of SecComp is actually uh, to prevent, if we saw earlier, the system calls with the cats and the lasers. Uh, we wanted to prevent arbitrary processes from being able to make any further syscalls that they don't need. So the way it was originally implemented was 
you start the file running, you know, whatever the binary is, uh, you let it do whatever it's supposed to do to get set up. And then assuming it doesn't need to do any further system calls, you just set a flag somewhere that says, put it in sec comp mode. Um, and it only allows you to exit the program, sig return, or read or write to open file descriptors. So you'd have to wait for it to just like already have touched everything it needs to touch and then say, okay, sec comp go, um, which is a little clunky. Um, and the business never took off, so people didn't really think about this for a while. And then in 2012, Google was like, wait a minute, did you say this was for running arbitrary code on just anyone's machine? Isn't that literally what a browser is? You're just like wandering around the internet with your JavaScript interpreter, just like running other people's JavaScript. Um, so they were like, oh, this is great. So there's something called the Berkeley packet filter that was implemented like completely separately, like 10 years before, 15 years before. Um, that was for originally uh, exactly like it sounds. It was for packet filtering uh, happening in a little VM in the kernel. So you didn't have to do the filtering out in user space because this is like computationally expensive. Um, so at this point, since it was 15, 20 years ago, the Berkeley packet filter had been extended to the extended Berkeley packet filter, which also let you filter syscalls. So they were like, great, we're going to use that to make uh, seccomp able to use the eBPF to just write a filter on what uh, syscalls you need so that you don't have to wait until it's done some stuff and then it can only read and write to open file descriptors just from the beginning you can say when i run this you should only be able to do this subset of like 12 syscalls there's like over 300 in linux so maybe 12 is even too small um, so it's kind of like a firewall for syscalls if you just try to do any syscall outside that it just kills your process uh, and then C groups are more uh, a thing that's relevant for hosting providers. So uh, Google came up with this. They originally called it process containers, but essentially it's supposed to prevent DOS type attacks for things that are running on the same system. So you give a process basically a different view of what hardware resources are available to it. You're like, you're only allowed to use two gigs of memory or however many cores in the CPU. Um, so essentially it's that like mediation that you could have set in a hypervisor per VM, but instead you're doing it in the same kernel just per process. Um, so the only security feature it's providing is to prevent DOS attacks, but for certain programs, this, is, uh, this could be a security benefit. Okay, so now, what was this, 2006? So by 2006, 2007, we now have all the pieces that we think of today as being able to create a container. Uh, so LXC or Linux containers was the first implementation of this. Uh, it didn't have any orchestration. It was just like, cool, we can carve out a little piece of your operating system kernel and we can make a process look different. Uh, Cloud Foundry, are they still around? Uh, came out with Warden uh, in 2011. Originally they relied on LXC and then they rewrote it on their own, um, but they didn't take off as much as a little company called Docker in 2013. They also originally started with LXC uh, and then later spun off what they wrote when they re-implemented as something called libcontainer. Um, Google did the same thing uh, with a project called Let Me Container That For You that came out the same year, but they just chose to contribute it back to uh, libcontainer when Docker open sourced it. And then you may have heard of Google's Borg system. Um, this was re-implemented and then released publicly two years after Let Me Container You For You, Let, let Me Container That For You, uh, as Kubernetes, which uh, among other things allows for like graceful failovers. There were some like zombie process issues with like the PID namespace and Docker. Um, in addition to like the orchestration things you think of as like auto scaling and graceful failovers and stuff like that. Um, but they also did a really cool other thing, which they're still actively developing, which is allow you to layer more security concepts on top that we talked about earlier. Um, a pod network policy, uh, we didn't quite cover. It's sort of a, a more unique thing where you've got something that's mediating the network calls uh, between all of your pods, um, but pod security policies gate the ability of a pod to enter a cluster if you don't have either SE Linux or AppArmor or SecComp uh, or given capabilities or namespace configurations on your pod. So all of these things, because um, essentially C groups uh, and particular namespaces were what we think of as creating a container by itself, but now you get to leverage all of these other things that have been built into the container or built into the kernel for like 20 plus years, um, which is super cool. That said, is there anyone in this room that's using Kubernetes that is actually using SE Linux or AppArmor on their pods? SecComp? 
I haven't found any room full of people that's actually done this. Uh, if it's helpful, they come with like a default app armor configuration and a default like suggested sec comp filter, um, both of which they inherit from Docker. Um, but I have never seen even super advanced um, companies that are using Kubernetes that are not using the default filter for these things. But it's available. Um, and then as a just sort of aside, whatever happened to BSD post lawsuit? Um, so actually around the same time that uh, the government was coming out with uh, SecComp, they introduced jails. Um, and this was from a shared hosting provider. They're small. I don't know if they're still around. Um, and it's basically all of the things that we thought of as uh, creating a container like eight years later. Um, so it was both a system call and a user space call or user space um, process name. So it isolated the file system, the users, the networking. Um, it gave like every container that was jailed a separate IP. Um, so it's actually, um, where was it? Yeah, IOCell. IOCell is something that was sort of like uh, an easy way to like package and manage a jail in the same way you would a container, but I couldn't find anything that would actually orchestrate it. Um, and Docker's been ignoring uh, BSD since 2015. They released an alpha. I haven't tried it. Uh, and then like, it's been like four or five years and they haven't touched it. So clearly nobody's going to use that in prod. Um, BSD mostly, I don't know if you guys have seen it anywhere else. I just see it in like racked network devices um, because I've been told from other sysadmins that the way BSD implements networking just makes more sense and is more efficient. Um, but like, unless like Google decides the BSD is the way to go. I don't see any devs like throwing any time into this. Uh, and then similarly, uh, Mac is based on, it's sort of a cousin of BSD. It's based on like um, a similar kernel and it takes a bunch of the components sort of the way like the, the herd tools are like running on Linux. Um, but they have like, they have taken this a whole separate direction and they've had decades to do it. So uh, they have something called app sandbox entitlements uh, and then they've actually gone like completely another way and they use um, a whole hypervisor implementation. And apparently if you're a developer, a uh, hyperkit is an easy wrapper to use this. Um, but I also don't see anybody like doing anything with this in prod because they have really strict licensing issues. So you have to have Apple hardware to run an Apple VM and you can only run two VMs on your hardware. So this is a bummer. There is at least solid Docker for Mac so that people can develop on it. Um, oops, that slide should have been updated. That was my last job, sorry. <laughs> I just started this week, you guys. Um, <laughs> um, well, anyway, I'm just gonna not look at that slide. That was my talk. Does anyone have uh, Linux or container questions? Yeah. Wow. Um, the question, sorry, was how many people are deploying containers with read-only file systems? I'm not on Twitter, and I haven't been polling people about that when I've talked, so I have no idea, but that's definitely a solid first step um, that was, like, not even covered here. I guess technically that's, like, the uh, discretionary access control. Um, I'll have to poll the internet or, or the room if you want. How many people using containers are doing read-only file systems? Are we doing read-only file systems? Okay, well, look around. That's encouraging. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's, what are some, uh, I guess, reading or, I guess, people I've had on Twitter to sort of get a connect or the history and sort of the uh, understanding that you have that you've got to place? I don't know uh, about it. <laughs> um. So the question was, who can I add on Twitter? What can I read? I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Medium, but uh, I'm just like one crazy person like ranting about this. Um, I always like the Unix and Linux System Administrator's Handbook, fourth edition, um, because I think it's actually like a really fun book and not very dry. And the cover is filled with visual puns. In fact, as you learn more, the cover is funnier and funnier, which is like a nice advantage. <laughs> Uh, I think it's the Linux and Unix system administrators handbook and that we're on the fourth edition. Yeah, it's pretty thick. Um, 
but it'll be the one where it's like a boat and there's a ship and there's like a lot of weird things happening on it and like those are the things that get funnier i promise <laughs> yeah That's true. Yeah. So the comment was that visibility gets really harder as we go this direction. Um, and yeah, it's a real pain in the um, whatever is safe to say in this crowd uh, to try to like see what's going on in containerized environments in a way that like you can consistently identify. Um, sort of another thing that like doesn't necessarily have to do with like the security, but more just like the uh, ephemeral nature of containers is that you might have like reference to a container which will be like a long snapshot like hash number uh, and it won't exist anymore um, and I've definitely tried to talk to people about like what would you do if like like how would you sorry how would you recognize like a popped container and then how would you grab like a forensic type snapshot um, so I want to say docker commit is a way to do that um, but I haven't gotten a chance to play with this in a sandbox and there's not like Nobody had an awesome security story, you know? It was like, oh, a popped container? Kill it. And you're like, right, so I can spin up another vulnerable container to get popped. Like, like do you want me to just keep playing whack-a-mole? Like, I want to see what actually got compromised so I can patch it and push it back out. Um, yeah, not, not a super awesome security story uh, or response story and forensic story around containers at the moment. Um, but if anybody has a good one, maybe give it as a talk because I would love to attend. Yeah. What is the biggest security vulnerability in Unix? Probably, um, like, th this is like a cop out, but um, it's probably just that like developers now can just like push stuff out without like a system administrator holding their hand, and like defaults are bad. So it's just like it's not actually like an issue with Unix as much as like like bad defaults, you know what I mean? So no one's actually making use of all of these things, um, which like, I guess theoretically you could try to be like a little bit stricter and more annoying in your build pipeline, but like no one ever does that from the beginning and it's really hard to take things away from people once they have them. Um, yeah, I guess like, I guess you could say privilege escalation, but more like maybe just being able to make uh, calls out or access parts of the file system that you shouldn't already, like. Uh, what about an exploit from the outside? Um, I mean, honestly, with a lot of this, like, uh, I want to say statistically, probably a main problem, especially with like Kubernetes, is people just like misconfigure the manager, which is not necessarily a Unix specific thing. Like, I believe this is actually an OWASP 2017 thing, right? It's just like uh, security misconfigurations generically are like a top 10. Cool, well, thanks guys. And if you have Kubernetes, go play with the basic seccomp. Okay. Does everyone still hear me? So I don't, I think we're going straight into the next talk, right? Okay, so let me load this up. So I was thinking um, my kernel is the brain and when I drink coffee, that's like a syscall. So that's quite good. Um, and then we're gonna go to our final talk. And I also had a university professor who was a, um, he did his PhD in role-based access controls. So that was quite interesting too. So we have one more talk, everyone. If you want to, we are starting right now. Okay, so we are starting now. So if you do want to have a conversation, I'd recommend leaving it until the end. All right. Oh. Okay. So 
I understand some people made to leave, and that's perfectly fine, but we do have one more speaker of the evening, so if you could please um, grab your seats if you can, quickly grab a drink if you need to. So our final speaker is Kavya, and she is a cyber guardian. And when it comes to ethics and integrity, she's probably the one person I would trust to stop Skynet and the artificial intelligence uprising. So brings it back to Justin's conversation. Uh, and today, Kavya is going to talk to us about what CTFs are good for. So off to Kavya. Thank you, Luis. So, yeah, it, when Luis wrote that introduction, he was gonna say, I'm the one to stop the Skynet and AI and stuff. And I was like, no, when it comes to it, it takes an integrity, let's just keep that. <laughs> so thanks everyone for staying around. Uh, this is probably the simplest talk. You know, all of you are probably familiar with CTFs. So that's why I'm gonna use this to make just a few points. One being, I happen to work with really awesome people. And uh, that's awesome people of Wellarm. And uh, second is a bit of an uncomfortable topic that came up as I was uh, writing this talk about CTFs. So I'll bring that up. And I just want to gather, you know, this is a community meetup. I just want to gather your opinion about something that makes me uncomfortable. So let's just use this opportunity to just have a honest conversation around CTFs and around topic that I'll bring up. And then finally, you know, ask me about anything uh, pertaining to the talk or wall arm or, you know, anything else that comes through the talk. So it was 2014. This was my very, very, very first CTF. I was still a grad student. I was doing my master's in network security and it was an invite only CTF by US Cyber Challenge. And years later, like till date, I put that on my resume. So I realized that, it, you know, even though it wasn't like my best performance, uh, that day, um, it was actually a boot camp. So we sat through, there were about 53 of us. We sat through like a boot camp reverse engineering class, incident response class, uh, cryptography type of class for about four days. And then on the fifth day, we had this CTF type of competition. And my team and I, we were sixth. Guess what? There were only six teams. So I was like beating myself up. <laughs> I just, you know, um, at least in grad school, I always get like A's. I maintained a GPA, a GPA of 4.0, so this was like really bad for me. But then as I like stepped out of Moraine Valley, this college uh, where the CTF was, I thought to myself, I was like, wait a second. And somebody actually shared a picture with me. It's like 53 dudes, like 52 guys. And I was really literally the only girl besides Karen who was like the sponsor of the CTF. So I was like, you know what? It's okay. This is not bad. <laughs> I'm here and I learned a whole bunch of things. And yes, I was the last along with the team, but we did capture a few flags. So that's fine. So the moral of the story is, you know, okay, you may not be the top performer in the CTF, but at the end of the day, you might learn something. Which fast forward brings me to who I am. And as Lewis said, people have started to call me like a cyber guardian because I happen to, in my past uh, former employ employment, I was protecting two virtual economies. Anybody heard of Second Life? So Linden Lab is the maker of Second Life. They maintain the oldest virtual economy uh, via Second Life, the oldest virtual world for now 16 years and running. And I was the information security director for that. After leaving that in March, I started a nonprofit called XR Safety Initiative. It's a nonprofit that advocates for security, privacy, and ethics in virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. And just about a couple of weeks ago, we released, not released, but revealed a 3C framework in Vancouver, which would basically essentially protect these new ecosystems that are popping up that are not just native to virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, but to like any kind of community, any massive multiplayer online type of community. 
And this sort of framework takes into account the risks that were ignored by Facebook and other big, massive ecosystems that come up, uh, potentially not addressing misinformation, deep fakes from the get-go. And now that we start to build these community in virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality, these things are gonna come up. I happen to be advising Facebook during US presidential election time in 2016. So I took some of those lessons. I also wrote some recommendations that were unheard, but now that's exactly what I'm doing is plugging it into you know, virtual world, augmented mixed reality. I also advise Wallarm, which we will talk about later why it's relevant to CTF. But what is CTF? Most of you probably know CTF is like capture the flag. Traditionally, it was like a traditional game where you had two teams. One team would you know, go after the other team. They would have two different flags or objects. They will capture the object and then bring it back to their turf. And while they per the person is bringing it back, you could either get tagged, you could put it, be put in jail, frozen, or some other person will protect you, yada, yada. So, I think the first recorded case was like 1992, Richard Barr um, wrote like an MS-DOS program to do CTF, but the actual one was 1996, I believe, DEF CON rolled out the first CTF. And most of us are familiar with, the, with that. So there are two types of CTF. DEF CON qualifier is what they do is a Jeopardy-like CTF, which is, you know, you have a bunch of these tasks, you're teamed up, whoops, and I may be a little nervous here. <laughs> so yeah, uh, there are two types of CTFs, Jeopardy and Attack and Defend. So you team up, there are you know, a set of number of tasks that you go through, and then com more complex the task, higher the points. And that's kind of like a DEF CON qualifier. The other one is the actual DEF CON final you know, CTF that happens is defend and attack, where you are basically given your own network, your own services, your own uh, infrastructure type of a team structure, and then you partner up together to find like vulnerable services. And you not only you're attacking, but you're defending as well. You're patching your services at the same time and then trying to look for uh, the offensive or the enemy team's uh, unpatched services. And that's like your real DEF CON competition that takes place every year. Some well-known CTFs are here. The one that I was part of for a while was CTF365.com. It was free, so I was like, you, you know, why not? But then one day they sent like an email that had like every person's email address attached to like not BCC. So I was like, oh, okay, I don't know if I trust these guys. <laughs> Plus they started charging for it. So I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not into it. But yeah, otherwise, you know, conference-wise, I think DEF CON is a pretty good one. Uh, I wouldn't start there, but I would definitely look into it. Uh, One Hub, Hack the Box, Root Me, I already talked about CTF65, and there are, you know, companies, uh, Google, Facebook, and a bunch of other companies that actually put out these CTF-type competitions, something to look into. Common tools for CTF, like, I, I would, imagine that almost every one of you sort of knows these tools. So instead of like, I don't know, me talking, can anybody tell me about WP scan, what it does? There. Exactly, so it just scans, you know, vulnerabilities for, WordPress for vulnerabilities, and uh, it's like a very basic, uh, something that you use to, uh, during the CTFs. Burp Suite, anyone? Yeah, like a reverse proxy, but proxy. And uh, yeah, again, another tool open. It used to be open, uh, open source, right? It's still open source or? Premium. It's, yeah, now they have the enterprise version and a bunch of other options available. Kali Linux, anybody who does pen tests probably uses Kali Linux. It's like a platform that you use to do pen testing. It comes with its own whole bunch of tools for pen testers. And map, the very first thing that you would probably do is like do a and map scan of whatever infrastructure you're trying to pen test or find vulnerabilities in. 
um, basically sends a bunch of packets to your infrastructure, receives some response or not, and makes some decision. Um, Metasploit, again, another sort of platform framework, I would say, uh, to do CTF type of uh, participation. Armitage, anybody knows Armitage? Um, when I saw Armitage, like the graphical user interface, the first time I was like, wow, this is amazing. Because it like literally lets you visualize how these boxes are set up and how one gets popped and it gets read. It's really cool to see. Uh, Armitage? A-R-M-I-A-T-A-G-E. And it sort of interfaces with the Metasploit instance to sort of, you know, combine these queries and you know, pr produce uh, results. Wireshark, Wireshark is a packet analyzer, packet capture, you can do like PCAP stuff and analyze to the bits and bytes and the hexadecimals what you need to do. Really helpful when you're trying to capture a flag or analyze traffic or, or what's going on in the infrastructure. And crack is like a high speed authentication cracker. You can just, uh, use this, uh, most people use this for audit because they're trying to figure out whether, you know, some authentication process is broken or can be broken and whatnot. So these are just, you know, some of the tools. Uh, when I was preparing for the CTF, uh, we learned about uh, WTF Samurai, Beef, Nikto, some of the web apps related uh, application security tools. Uh, those are still useful, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but these are just common ones. CTFs versus hackathons, who knows what's the difference? CTFs like competitions that give you like a real life scenario as to what might be going on if you're going to defend an uh, enterprise or an infrastructure. Uh, what are the packets or the, you know, what are the hack hacker type of scenarios that you could run into? How do you do the analysis? Sorry? Yeah, like social engineering has kind of become one of those CTF points as well uh, to try to get into a building. Hackathon, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily have to include the quote pen tester technical people or break the stuff type of people. It could be any technologist. It could be around non-technology issues as well, where you're trying to solve a specific type of problem. So Wallarm actually last year did a hackathon. And they have made available their one of their uh, TensorFlow model. It's, uh, you know, if you look it up on GitHub, is called Walnet. And so the, what they did is like their machine learning based detection model that was based off of TensorFlow, they made it available, they provided the data set and they're like, all right, we just really want to learn how to do machine learning based detection. And whoever does it best, yada yada they did this hackathon it was really cool and they learned a lot and that thing is still available so you can go on the github and uh, download this walnet uh ctfs on the other hand is more about like hunting uh, flags or participating in a competition getting some real life knowledge without having to have the pressure of the real life attack scenario um so going back to what are the ctfs good for uh, anybody remembers this from last month? This is a vulnerability that one of, and like I said, you know, I work with awesome people. So Andrew Denau, he is one of the researchers. He was just playing CTF, found this RCE vulnerabilities, a vulnerability in, um, in the code. Um, although something um, that was really noticeable, I was like, why isn't Andrew online talking about or bragging about any of these things? And it's so surprising. Like, I don't know if anybody even knows his Twitter handle. I do now because I was like, you need to talk to me, tell me what happened, what all went down and what is this all about? So anyhow, in Andrew's own word, like I managed to finally have a conversation with him. He's not a native English speaker, but this is what he had to say. Uh, he started in 2011 when he was 21, and he still loves to play this. And he, this is not his first time where he's di discovered, uh, you know, this type of vulnerabilities. He did that back in 2017, where again, there was a CV that was assigned to it as well. About this vulnerability, and he likes to play because, you know, he gets this feeling of, oh, I win, and, uh, or you learn something, and every once in a while, you get to be like a semi-famous, end up on ZD, or hacker news. 
one thing about this vulnerability that he discovered was it was not like, oh, here's a CTF PHP specific. It just so happens that he was working in this environment and found this PHP specific vulnerability. Another thing is uh, you don't have to have, like, you know, if you have a PHP running on Apache, it's probably, it won't affect you at all because it's the vulnerability in the extension. So you would have to have like an Nginx specific configuration, which people think is common or uncommon, but here's the thing, the hosting providers, the cheap hosting providers, I think there is like a treasure hunt going on right now because they generally are like the last one to be like, oh, who's gonna patch this or who's gonna worry about this? That's where probably most of the data you know, people are doing like a treasure hunt right now until everybody else catches up and patches these. So it's like a, you know, not a very common thing, but if it happens, then I, I bet like Andrew feels on top of the world discovering this thing. Okay, so my second point, the uncomfortable sort of kind of conversation is uh, what else are CTF good for? As I was looking for, you know, what are CTFs being used for? I noticed there is a couple of groups that are organizing CTF to promote diversity. And, which is great. I love diversity. I'm like born in India. My parents are Hindu. My, my last name is Jewish. I practice Islam. I'm brown. Like I am all about diversity. In general, I was a hairstylist, then decided to become a cybersecurity person. Now I'm known as Cyber Guardian. Like this is diversity, this is great. However, why are we saying no to men? And that's what like kind of bothered me. I don't know how many people just kind of bothered by the idea that it's just like women only stuff like I am personally. At least, uh, you know, raise your hand. I just wanted to like get, just capture the gist of it. Like when you have like an M and you just like invert it, it becomes a W, but it's like same exact symbol. <laughs> In fact, if you really look within like a philosophy of diversity and inclusion, it does almost the opposite. I mean, at least to me, if I'm a guy and I'm like not allowed to any competition or anything, it makes me feel not included. And then this whole diversity thing becomes like, oh yeah, here we go about diversity again bunch of these women getting together and bashing guys. Who knows, like, you know, this, these type of thoughts will come to my mind. And I hear them too as well on Twitter. So I don't know, I think I'm gonna continue this conversation that I started today. And uh, I think we all need to. I understand. And I feel like just don't use word inclusion in your model if you're not going to be inclusive. That's my only point. Don't sell me inclusion if you're not inclusive. Uh, you know, and I have some other personal reasons to be advocating for this because I reached out for help to some of these organizations and I was told no because maybe I'm too political or don't look a certain way, I don't know. So anyhow, uh, the other one that happened, which was, you know, again, another diversity uh, uh, CTF, uh, it took place on 2nd of November and uh, WOSEC, Women of Security, uh, they brought about 1,000 plus girls to participate in this CTF, which is incredible. And I think that's what CTFs are really good for, is to promote these philosophies that are lacking in our you know, overall community, overall ecosystem, we need to. Um, CTMs are good for, you know, just have fun. Have a, you know, meet people, like-minded people. In fact, the person that I met at Moraine Valley, one of the instructors, Tim Medine, he's still a good friend. Every time he updates his T-shirt with his uh, company called Red Siege, it's a pen testing company, sends me one. And you know, you just never know what kind of incredible friends you might end up making and share knowledge. Things that you might learn, things that you natively know, you might end up sharing with people. 
And I know if uh, being Hindu, Jew, and uh, Muslim was not enough, I just quoted myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so you want to get started? You know, be an artist, be like a hacker, be like an attacker, think like that. And then security skills, you will continuously learn them. When I attended my first CTF, I, I had no idea what is it all about. But today, at least I can say that, oh, I did a talk on CTF. <laughs> so you just never know. Just get started and, you know, try to be an expert. Um, anybody going to KubeCon this year? I'm going to be there if you want to talk to me there. And I'm also going to be at AppSec Cali. I just touched a very slight point while I was talking about Wallarm Hackathon about using machine learning detection or using machine learning based detection. So I'm going to do a talk there. And if you're going to be in AppSec Cali, I would love to connect with you. Uh, so please reach out. And uh, all those uncomfortable type of conversations, I love to have them. I have no problem with it. <laughs> uh, if you want to talk about virtual reality, augmented mixed reality, that's my game. And uh, yeah, any questions? And if you have no questions, please ask me what does Wallarm do? I know it's the end of the night, everybody wants to go home. Yay! I have a slide for this. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I seriously, you know. Because I'm a consultant to Wallarm, I'm not their native employee. I just kind of take pride in the fact that this is, these are like the cool people that I'm working with. Here are two things that Wallarm has. Wallarm, is a, Wallarm has Fast and WAF. Their web application firewall is not using signatures. It's using Gen 3 detection. Far from mod security. I met Christian Filoni in Amsterdam. A whole another story when I told him I want to speak, and then once he heard me, he's like, mm, no. <laughs> because mod security uses Gen 1 detection, and Wallarm is building what is the signature-less approach. So don't want to get too pitchy. Now let's come to the second amazing thing that Wallarm does. Anybody heard of DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing, which you know, sits on the outside of the infrastructure, tries to attack all your code, scans your code, does all the, you know, was top 10 fuzzing and all these other stuff dynamically. Wallarm has developed another approach, which is called FAST. And this is what it does. It actually sits or protects you during the CI CD pipeline. So during the CD phase, it literally tests only what your application is doing. And I'm reading a book uh, on machine learning. Um, it's called The Master Algorithm by Pre P uh, Peter Clemengo. And it's literally, machine learning is all about like evolving. Like more you learn, better you get. So they have the VAF sitting here sort of learning and sending the semantic data to FAST. So it's learning the, how your application is supposed to act. Instead of scanning the entire code, it's literally just scanning what is the good behavior? And the, one of the best skills that you can learn or as a person or as a machine is what is the unexpected behavior for an app? And that's what it does. So remember those red hot button that we invented? I helped invent during GDPR time, like delete all the database. Well, I have a story where this customer was running DAST and it was like delete.exe and it bloody deleted everything. So that's the kind of thing like, you know, when you do functional testing and lay over the security testing, that's what these guys do. And I think that's really amazing. I can't believe people are not onto them already because there are not that many companies that do that. And this is the way to go. And I think with that, um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you have any advice as to like, if there is any books or any uh, maybe knowledge, prior knowledge that you need before joining in a CTF competition. Like if you were to start today, if you were to meet somebody today that is interested in, in starting or practicing tap, uh, CTF, what would be your advice for them to get to a comfortable to the point where they can participate in the competition? Competition. What's your name? My name is Gail. Gail. Yes. So one thing I definitely want to do is I want to connect with you on LinkedIn 
and then maybe explore together what exactly is where exactly you are and what you may be looking for because based on what skill set you have like i was a hairstylist at one point all i really like i needed to build a bridge to learn like literally from like what is an ip address what is binary <laughs> How, what is hexa you know so depending on the skill set uh, I would advise accordingly. So, yeah, the question is, you know, what uh, books and stuff? I think there are a lot of books. Uh, I can't think of like maybe more than two off the top of my head. Uh, Hacker's Handbook, a pen testing book, is a really good one. I forget the name of the author. Mm -hmm. And then there is a web application handbook. Louis, do you do you know the name? It's like a this thick book. Um, yeah so yeah in fact Fishing hackers handbook so right. by the creator of burp suite I was just saying yeah like <laughs> i think that was something that was recommended to by to me by another hacker um and uh those are the two that i think is really good place to start and i'm sure they're uh a hacker's handbook was the first one the web, app, web application practitioner book or something like that yep yeah, well, this guy said that, you know, just get this book because, you know, I was not really an AppSec person just about six months ago. And I'm now diving into all these AppSec stuff, learning about container security, talking about container security and, uh, you know, talking about machine learning based detection, using application security stuff. I'm literally at that stage where I'm reading these books. And uh, yeah, it's a great question. You, you actually had a, a list up that's really good. Two things like on the wire and Volnov, um, kind of getting images and, and taking notes off that. It's right here. And reading other people's write ups. That's a, yeah, that's a really good point. Is, uh, what, this is what happened to me. Once I knew, like, this is what I want to do with my life, I just went Googling, meeting people, talking, and, you know, you, you just, when you know what you want in life, the universe gets busy trying to make that happen <laughs> that's kind of what you know just once you know just laser in on it and then beautiful things could happen and please connect with me on linkedin Nice. So it's like OWASP native damn web vulnerable application or something. Yeah. Nice. Oh, what's juice shop? Oh, shop. Okay. Now, last question. Yes. Among the tools that you yeah, mentioned, and I'm always, it's a question for, I guess, maybe the audience. Everybody talks about Burp Street, but nobody talks about OAS Zap. <laughs> Why is that? We are in the OAS meetup, and it's a tool that I believe You're right, has the same capacities as Burp Street, but nobody is. Like not a lot of people are mentioning it, making it worth knowing or learning when it's free and it's open source. So, any pen testers want to answer that? Why not Zap? I use that just for info. Yeah, I, I just ha didn't happen to put it up there. But Ellis, you got something to say? So I think it's perfectly fine to use both, but ultimately with um, Burp Suite, you have things like the collaborator until those things are integrated into Zap. So the collaborator sits as a server and it gets like out of bound requests and those things are completely missed in, in Zap. There's also a, the payload detection is a lot better in Burp and it's mainly because it's, you know, it's a paid product, right? So there are extensions you can use in the community version, but it's a paid product. It's got 50 developers plus more, you know, working on it full time. So, I mean, it's always going to be ahead of the game from Zap, but if you are a small business and you, if you're a small business and you have, um, you know, not really that much budget, I mean, obviously a, a Burp license is pretty cheap in, in reality compared to quite a lot of the other products. I don't work for Burp, by the way, but um, 
but Zap is obviously a very good alternative and it's very easy to hook into CI CD. So um, Zap is a very good alternative and it does, so it does uh, web sockets and so on. So it kind of covers the entire plethora of things like HTTP, HTTPS. It also can analyze like different protocols uh, and different things. So I think it's fine to use both. But the reason why probably people use Burp is because if you take a look at their, um, so, um, OWASP, so there's OWASP juice shop and stuff, but also there's the Hacker Academy. So there's uh, the Burp Hacker Academy has a bunch of like, um, resources you can do to learn about server-side request forgery, about all these new attacks that like James Kettle and Gareth Hayes are working on. There's a bunch of things that you can do. So, I mean, that, that's probably why. So, sorry to go on a tangent about, yeah, the product I don't work for. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah, I think community makes a huge difference in every case. And yeah, that's what community is up for, so we can go on a tangent. All right, any other questions? Yes? Uh, this isn't really a question, but can I mention an upcoming CTF that my company is hosting? Uh, sure. We're so, talking about CTF. Uh, a, week, a week from now, Pinterest is hosting a CTF. Um, it's going to be at 149 Bluffton Street. And you can get, uh, you can register on Eventbrite. If you search Pinterest on Eventbrite, it'll be the first thing that comes up. Nice. So there is an upcoming CTF at Pinterest. <laughs> Anything else, guys? All right, well, thank you everybody. And thank you for sticking around. Hello, one, two, yeah, thank you. It was very informative. The one good thing about CTFs as well is that, you know, one person doesn't have all the knowledge. There's a lot of, you have all, you have all the magic power right now. <laughs> um, the, the one good thing about um, CTFs is that you know one person doesn't know everything. I wouldn't know anything more than just web apps because that's my specialty. So you would want to work with other people um, that ultimately have different types of skill sets, such as network or looking at different protocols and so on. So finally, you know we're towards the end. Thank you for sticking around. Hopefully you enjoyed the talks. And first, can we get a, a round of applause for our speakers? Thank you. Fantastic. Diff lots of different types of problems. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say thank you to some of our sponsors. Um, so we have like Adobe and Bob Crowd and Synac and HackerOne and so on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, we're not very good at, you know, we don't, we don't work at Pinterest, so we can't make things nice. Yeah. <laughs> so and also thank you for some of our other, other, other sponsors as well. So like Google, Netflix, HackerOne, Twilio and so on. So thank you. I'll give a round of applause for all of our speakers. Sorry, so sponsors. And finally, one last hurrah for Okta. I think this man behind us all did the most amazing job today getting everything to work. So thank you, Okta, for hosting. Um, and with that, with that, there are T-shirts that Okta have given away behind you. So please grab them, get one for the dog, get one you know, for whatever you wish. And thank you for coming, and we'll see you in January. So thank you. Oh, yeah, and if you're interested in hosting, come and talk to us.